have some parts in control. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon we have with us our Stephen Hawley. Steve was our former assemblyman. He was assemblyman for the 137th Assembly District. Uh, 20 years, what, 20 years? 19 years. Ah, give it a take a year, what the heck. Uh, I worked for Steve both in Batavia and in Albany for three years. I was his executive assistant. Uh, so we've been friends for quite a long time. Last Friday, we had Bill and Hamilton come in and talk about flying train of Armenia, flying the hump as it was known. And if you remember, he commented about how what he felt compared to what he thought was the trouble of the foot soldier in Burma. Uh, today, uh, Steve Hawley's going to tell you about what it was like slugging through the jungles of Burma as an artillery captain? Well, eventually I was a lieutenant then. Lieutenant then, but uh, an artillery officer in Burma uh, with a mud and the jungle and all that. So let me turn it over to Steve and he can fill you in on his experiences in Burma. Well, thank you, Paul. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be asked over here to talk about my experiences in World War II. And I can really imagine, you think of World War II was a thousand years ago, and it really is in all respects. I can remember when I was a kid and people talking about World War I, and I didn't even realize about it. But Paul, well, I appreciate being invited. And Paul was a very energetic person when he was working for me here in the day and in Albany. And I appreciated very much his assistance. And I went to a party last Sunday and uh, for Malin Hamilton. Actually, it was his 80th birthday. And I uh, had about 50 people there. Anyway, he came up to me. And and said, I just got through talking with Paul Schulte's class about my experiences in Burma and India. And uh, but I talked about flying. And I said, well, I'm coming over there next week and talk about being on the ground. Uh, it's a vast difference, but no job was any better or worse than anybody else's because there were dangers, whatever you do. I uh, will just give you a short uh, a recap of my life to some extent. I hope it's a little bit interesting. I was in, uh, I was born and brought up, and I still live right down here on Bank Street, uh, the head of College Road, where it comes off. And I lived as a kid up the road about a quarter of a mile. And I think I was very fortunate to uh, have been born on a farm and have the family I did because they introduced me to working and they introduced me to a pony and a horse, and I got acquainted with animals uh, very early in life and realized that they are really something special and, and uh, very loyal to uh, a human being if you are uh, good to them. And I think that's the secret of <clears throat> uh, working with animals. Well, anyway, 1941, when the war broke out, when Jap the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, as you know, uh, I was 19 and at Cornell and uh, having a great time, just like I hope you people are at times here in college. And uh, when they found Pearl Harbor, it was such a shock to the world that uh, I think anyone that was alive in those days remembers the exact room he or she was in and who was in the room. And uh, it was such a, a major thing, event. And uh, there are people in Batavia that were at Pearl Harbor and, uh, in those days. <coughs> anyway, I, uh, my interest in, in animals, uh, I got to Cornell and, and I found there was ROTC there, Reserve Officers Training Center. And they had a horse outfit, believe it or not. And uh, they had a polo team at Cornell. So I was kind of interested in animals, as I said, and so I went over and started uh, playing polo with the team, and we were using army horses. And uh, of course, this fit in very well with my psyche. I was in the agriculture school. And that went on until 41 when 
Jap Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, and then I was immediately inducted into the Army, but uh, could stay in school under ROTC. And uh, that uh, was quite impressionable to me that everything changed. All of our lives changed, and they were taking people in at 18 years old, and uh, it was a strange time. The, I finally got out of Cornell in February of 43, and was immediately sent to uh, Oklahoma for a three months course to become an officer in artillery, and graduated from there, and then was sent to the 71st Division up in Camp Carson, Colorado, which was a PAC artillery division. And uh, uh, I forgot to tell you, before that, when I graduated, I took a pack artillery course. We learned to pack mules, both with uh, goods and everything, and guns, uh, artillery guns. And so I was up in Fort Carson. Then we went out to California and maneuvers, which means that you uh, are in the field with a, another division against you. It's like a practice field and you maneuver against each other and find out your faults and so forth. And anyway, he went down to, to Georgia after that, and then all of a sudden, on a Friday afternoon, we were out in the firing range, and uh, this uh, other officer came up and said, the old man wants to see you right away. You know, the old man is the commanding officer, of course. And so I went in, and, and there were four of us there from the battery. And we were all going to be sent overseas. And it was quite an interesting time. I wondered what was going to be going on. And I'd just been married for a month, uh, which another, was another rather traumatic experience, as you can imagine. And anyway, we flew to Los Angeles. And within a week, we were on a boat uh, going out to the Pacific. And uh, if you're ever in, a, in an experience where you don't know what's going on, uh, it, uh, it's kind of shaking up a little bit, but there were 5,000 of us on the troop ship, and we went over and stopped in Fiji, which is uh, an island in the middle of the Pacific, and then we stopped in Australia, and stayed there for a couple of days, and uh, I want to talk about this map. Uh, then we went from there on up to India. Now, you'll have to excuse this map, it isn't quite perfect, but if you think of uh, here is, here's the U.S., and we started out this way, and of course, think of this as a globe. Came over here, down below Australia, and then way up here, and into India, in Bombay, and uh, it took uh, 42 days. And someone mentioned when we got up towards India, well, maybe we're going to Burma, and, <coughs> excuse me, I don't know anybody that knew where the heck Burma was because it's a little spot on the map and in Asia and, and uh, I'm not going to ask a question from any of you about where Burma is, but uh, it's over here and we got off the ship, the first off, and, and uh, India is quite a shock because it's so uh, tragic the way people live. There were dead people, believe it or not, lying right on the street and old horses and donkeys and people they put us on a train anyway and took us off the airfield and uh, we waited there for about six hours right next to an airplane. It was a C-47 like Mainland Hamilton flew and there were 20 soldiers and, and I was a second lieutenant and me and we waited there and waited there. And finally the air crew came over and they started talking with us before we took off and he said to well, we're going to Burma, a little town called Michinaw, where there's an airport. And you better be ready to fight when you get off the plane. Well, that's, uh, again, a little bit earth shaking and wondering what was going on. But anyway, we flew all the way across India and landed in Burma. And it, it was a, the strip, as you looked out at it, it was just water, it looked like. Well, it was a gravel strip and it had been raining. And so, uh, water flew all over and everything and we stopped and I uh, went up and talked to the pilot and I said, what's going on here? Will you call and ask somebody? And you know, they told us, or you told us, 
they go that we're going to get off fighting. And he said, well, they are fighting right now. And I said, thank God. So we got off the plane and got it. They took us way down the road over uh, the campus by a river, the Irrawaddy River. And uh, anyway, we joined uh, what used to be Merrill's Marauders. And I don't know whether you ever heard of that or not. They made a movie of it. But uh, it was a group that was formed by General Stilwell of American soldiers. And they called themselves Long Range penetration group and they went across the northern part of, of Burma. They started here in India and walked uh, about 400 miles from fighting their way against the Japanese and ended at Michinaw, which was a an airport and uh, probably one of the awfulest stories that anybody ever thought of because the privations were, were very bad. They had American mules, by the way, and that carried everything and were supplied by airdrop, like Mr. Hamilton said. Uh, they put out uh, panels and planes would come over and if they could see them, they'd drop it. Of course, it very seldom hit anywhere near the, where they were supposed to because can you imagine you're going 150 miles an hour and see something and you have to push it out the door. Uh, very difficult, but it kept them alive and then uh, it kept me alive after we went down the road. And uh, it's one of the shocking things to me, the first time I saw someone killed, was uh, there were Chinese troops also uh, uh, in conjunction with our record going down. And there was a, we were walking along the, this dirt road and, and here was a Chinese soldier and, and a mule that had dropped off of the the road and down the embankment and this Chinese general was talking to him and all of a sudden he pulled out his pistol and shot him right in the head just like that. Well, it goes, it makes you remember that life is terribly cheap in Asia, just worth not as much as a fly even. It's quite appalling and hard to think of now and it isn't, it isn't even for me to think of. But uh, uh, that brought everybody's attention that we're right there. And we went on down at several battles going down the road. And this is to open up the Burma Road that had been closed uh, by the British in 1940. The Burma Road, I'll show you where it goes. Started here in India, went into Burma, and then up into China. And the reason that they were trying to open it is to try to keep the Chinese in the, in the war. Uh, and supply them with uh, all kinds of goods. And uh, so that, uh, after we got down to a little town of Amo, we were in town and uh, there were some visiting dignitaries and, and uh, I happened to be standing around there and I, I recognized one of the colonels. It was Colonel Coverdale who uh, had taught ROTC at Cornell. And so I quite, Broad and went up and said hello to him, and uh, he remembered me. And I asked him what he was doing there because he was not a member of our group. And he said, well, they, he was looking for uh, some instructors for the Field Artillery Training Center in China up in Kunming. And uh, he said, if I can wrangle it, would you want to come up there with me and teach? And I thought to myself, this is a good deal. <laughs> This is the good deal, and one of those happenstance things. And at that moment, I hoped that it would work out. Well, apparently he arranged it some way or other, and three of us uh, flew back to India, eventually, not immediately, and then flew over the hump, uh, which is over uh, over 10,000 feet. I don't know whether Ham did Ham fly to China too, and over, I think they flew way over 10,000 feet in bad weather in the, the lower part of the Himalayan mountains, which is a uh, pretty rough territory. I want to tell you, Burma is, is not civilized at all. There are little tribes of people that live alone up in the mountains and take care of themselves, and it's a very, very strange uh, situation. Anyway, I got to Kunming, and uh, we were teaching Chinese officers uh, how to fire artillery shells and how to plan and how to 
correct and, and the range and everything else. And so that part of the, the next uh, was about eight months uh, wasn't bad duty. It wasn't bad duty at all. I enjoyed it very much. And then the war was over in August. Uh, we dropped the bomb on uh, Japan, as you know, it was August 45. And uh, in, uh, in October, September, October, we flew to uh, all the way across to Shanghai. We're here about 2,000 miles over here, between here and there. Landed in Shanghai. And uh, uh, fooled around for a while. There wasn't much to do. And then all of a sudden, I was assigned to the Nationalist Army, as the Chinese Army, that wanted to transport troops from the south of China up to Manchuria, out of Hong Kong here, and up in the north of China, because there were communist troops up there, communist Chinese troops, that were fighting the nationalist troops, two polar different uh, armies in, in, in uh, China. And uh, they were supposed to take over the Japanese weapons and so forth. So I, I was a liaison with the U.S. Navy who transported these people. And uh, it was quite an interesting time. And uh, they had LSTs, which were landing ship tanks, that were designed for invasions. And they were flat bottom, and they'd go right into the beach and open the bow up, and the ramps would come down, and they'd walk out. Anyway, these, these are flat bottom things. I can remember an uh, inclinator on the wall and we'd go up about 35 degrees up and back like this and it was uh, not very good unless you were flat in the bed. Then I went down to Vietnam or what was called uh, South Vietnam and transported Chinese out of Saigon and up to Hong Kong which uh, uh, I think most of you know about Vietnam and where it is. South of China, and it was owned by the owned. The French ruled it for about 400 years, and uh, the local people were very, very angry at, uh, at the French nationally because they were treated very poorly and uh, revolted against them. And then eventually, we got drawn in there, and that was a real quagmire. And uh, any war is stupid and crazy. And uh, let's hope that uh, we don't get into any more. Uh, with that, I'd like to open it up to questions if there are any. And then I have a few uh, examples of, of uh, Burma on the table. And I got an ex-CBI mag magazine, China Burma India Theater, that tells a lot of stories. That uh, anybody got any questions? I thought you, I thought oh, you were raising your hand, but you're not. Okay. Any fireflies, Steve? Oh yeah, oh yeah, and yeah, it's always. Uh, if you want to be scared, I'll tell you, no soldier, no matter what you look at in the movies and everything else, uh, isn't just scared to death because uh, you can well imagine uh, if somebody's shooting rifles and ammunition and howitzers and everything else around, you're just being scared and you crawl on the ground trying to get away from things. And, uh, but we were lucky, we just never got there. Yeah. What, what kind of artillery? Well, I was a 75 millimeter uh, uh, pack howitzer that was carried, uh, took four mules that broke down into into pieces, and you loaded that mules. It took four to carry one gun. And uh, but mules, I, I was going to say, uh, talking about animals, are very, very loyal animals. It's a cross between a, a jack donkey and a large uh, workhorse mare, a, ma a female. And the result is a is an animal with very tough feet like the donkey, and uh, a mule does not get sick, uh, he won't overeat like a horse will, and uh, 
are very, very loyal if you're good to them. If you're good to them, they'll, they'll work very hard for you. And uh, I've seen a good many men uh, bone tired and hanging out of the tail of, of, of the mule and he pulled them along like this. But uh, we depended on them and they stood up well for us and carried everything they had. And uh, even in the air drops, they dropped uh, oats for the American oats for the mules. And uh, the supply lines are hard to imagine. You know, 10, 15,000 feet, they're miles long. And getting not only the troops at a certain spot, but all of the things that they need from clothes uh, and food and ammunition. So it was a major world effort. Well, uh, it's in the south, and uh, you get monsoon rains. And uh, I don't know whether any of you have been in the south, but well, we've had the hurricanes, and that's not like it rains in the, in the tropics. It just comes down in buckets like this. It doesn't, it isn't blowing no wind or anything else. And naturally, it gets very, very muddy and uh, difficult to walk, and in the mountains, uh, the mules were slipping a lot, and we lost the mules going down the mountains. And uh, but it's hot and humid, and, and not a comfortable place to to be or to work. But uh, fortunately, most of us returned from those kinds of situations. Yes. They, when you came home, did they debrief you at all? And when you came home, did did we? Was it like Vietnam when you came home? Were they well, like it must have been a lot different. And I'm glad you asked that question because, uh, uh, first of all, when we came into San Francisco on a troop ship, it was 5 o'clock in the morning, and the sun was just coming up. And it was a beautiful sight I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> there didn't seem to be the problems with soldiers. Uh, as there were after Vietnam, and I don't know why, because uh, uh, I think it was an era that we were brought up in. Uh, most of us, uh, most of everybody in the United States didn't have an awful lot because the country had been in a depression, and uh, 20 to 30 to 40 percent of the people didn't have any jobs, and there was no welfare. and. Uh, I can remember uh, people stopping in at our farm, uh, a couple of men walking down the road, and you'd see them all the time, and asking for a sandwich. Uh, but it was estimated there were four, four to five million men in the country just wandering around looking for a little job of some kind or other to buy a little food. But I think because uh, everybody was quite poor, uh, that the shock of being in the army wasn't that great because actually it was better because you have regular meals and good food and, and good clothes and but we worked very hard. But then after the war was over, I, everybody, most people served from two to four to five years. My brother was in five. Uh, everybody was so darn happy to get home. And, uh, there were very few problems like that. But it was different times, different times in Carly. And, and we had uh, theoretically something to fight for against the Germans and the Japs and so forth. And the Vietnam conflict was, was there was no real excuse that we were there. And, and I think the men and women that were involved uh, uh, felt put out, and I don't blame them at all. So uh, that's a good question. Good question. Anybody else? Oh, come on, people. <laughs> Well, let's see. Do you ever have any conversations with them, like the enemy? I couldn't hear that. Do you ever have any conversations with them, like after you've taken any prisoners or anything like that? I mean, do you ever talk to any of them? Do you ever talk to the enemy? The enemy? Oh, sure. On friendly terms? But you said that, uh, we did it through interpreters. We had, we had uh, Japanese Americans with us that could speak Japanese. And uh, uh, yes, we did talk to them. Some. 
and they were in very, very bad shape. Uh, naturally, they were Japanese and, and northern Burma uh, did not have a lot of supplies. They had lots of ammunition, but uh, their food was not very good. And uh, uh, the sight uh, of a Japanese soldier, many of them uh, committed suicide if they were going to be captured, if they weren't injured or, or shot or something. It was a strange psychology, but uh, somewhere or other the Japanese had, uh, leaders had imbued in their soldiers uh, uh, that they had to fight or die, period. And I think uh, after when the Japanese invaded the Philippine Islands in, uh, well, December 41, right after Pearl Harbor, uh, they defeated American forces that were there in the Philippines. And then uh, there was, they started marching these soldiers up to the northern part of the island for some reason or other, but they call it the Bataan Death March. Uh, they, they didn't feed them or give them water and things like that, but they lived an entirely different life than we did. Uh, they didn't have much. And we're psychologically, uh, uh, as I said, ready to, to fight or die. And, and oftentimes, most of the time, whether it was in the South Pacific Islands, uh, where our Army and Navy and fought up through from Australia all the way up to Japan, uh, these soldiers would, uh, these Japanese soldiers would just fight till they die. And uh, very few prisoners that were taken. The, I'd like to talk to Mr. Hampton a little bit more sometime. I often wondered how uh, how they found us. We put panels on the ground. Of course, we have radios. And incidentally, uh, there wasn't any electricity naturally out in the middle of nowhere. But we had these little generators, and you'd sit on them and, and uh, you'd turn them like this, and that would uh, generate some electricity to run the radios and to uh, uh, that's the only electricity game we had. We didn't have any. When it got dark, it got dark. And that was it. We call that uh, they had coordinates. Of course, the problem was trying to find the coordinates. That's right, to find uh, where we were. Uh, let me, I made a few notes here. Let me see if there's something that I would like to tell you. And, uh, Someone developed a process called V-mail, and you could buy these little sheets of paper, about half this size, and you write your letter on it and your address and so forth, and uh, they would take it and then they'd photograph these, and of course uh, each letter would be just tiny, and they could ship hundreds and thousands of letters in a, in a few pounds of film, and uh, oftentimes they must have flown it back because you could get a reply maybe in a month or two. And uh, then they bring it back to the United States, print it, and then send it by mail to whomever you mail it to. But that was a great invention of saving a lot of, uh, a lot of freight and, and getting mail across to people. First letter I had took three months to uh, to get there. It was quite uh, well received. We had several kinds of rations. There's uh, uh, the A ration was uh, large cans of everything under the sun. Then there's the C ration that was used in the field when you're uh, not too far away from anything, and it had two little cans about that that high, about that big around, and had cookies in it, and the other had some sort of a, of a egg or pork uh, mixed up stuff, or hash. And then there was a, uh, the D ration was a uh, uh, package about that long, about that wide, and, and like a big uh, chocolate bar, 
and that had uh, some dried uh, food of some kind in there. It tasted terrible, but it kept you alive, and that was the idea of it. And then the, the, the real uh, short ration was the K ration that uh, was just a candy bar, a chocolate. It was hard as this uh, podium, but you could chew it off and cut it off with a knife and it would gradually melt. But it didn't melt in the tropics and in, in the hot weather. So, uh, depending on where you were and, and uh, what your supply was, those are the different kinds of food you had. capture northern Burma was to reopen a road that had been there uh, before the war and uh, so that uh, we could supply the Chinese with war materials, food and everything else with a road rather than trying to fly every pound of it over the hump. And those C-47s only carried a couple of tons of food or, or merchandise. And I can remember when we uh, flew over the hump uh, out of India. Uh, it was at night, and there were three of us sitting on the side, and the rest of us barrels of gasoline and I don't know what all in the plane. And we kind of fallen asleep, or at least I had. And it was dark, and all of a sudden there's a boom, boom, boom. And I thought, I thought, I, wanted, I didn't know what the hell was going on. I, I was uh, asleep, and of course we had parachutes on, and, and the guy next to me pulled the ripcord in his parachute and it would all over everything, excuse me. And uh, it was just an interesting little, little event that happened. But uh, there were, actually there were two groups in China during the war and then after the war. The communist Chinese who were in North China and the nationalist Chinese the nationalist Chinese were uh, the leader with a fellow named Chiang Kai-shek, and he's the one that we were working with. And it's oftentimes we felt that much of some of the material, guns and ammunition and other stuff that we gave Chiang Kai-shek, he was storing to fight the Japanese, or the uh, communists, after the war was over. And it really was true, and that's why we uh, were transporting his troops up to northern China. But the Chinese communists just celebrated their 50th anniversary. Uh, Zhou and I took over in 1949, and of course 50 years later today. And they're still in power, but uh, in the early days of the Communist Party over there, they killed millions of people for goodness knows what kinds of reasons. Uh, but I understand it's uh, China is developing very fast, and I, I don't see how the communists can control the people because, as you know, you buy uh, some, some sneakers or a jacket or something, and oftentimes, most of the time, it's made in Asia someplace. Bangladesh or India or China, and they, they must have tremendously, tremendous big factories now to manufacture things. And China was the, one of, I talk about poor countries, China is one of the poorest in the world also. Uh, life was just nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, and uh, the way you and I were brought up here with a pretty nice standard of living, more or less, and plenty of clothes and food, uh, many people in Asia do not have uh, those terrible things. I hope this fellow doesn't say, I'm kidding. Hey, you are right, you are right. Got an eraser? Got an eraser. Ask me a silly question. Maybe I got an answer. I want to show them something that's not the problem. Well, all right. Uh, this, this is not bragging at all. I was, I was awarded this certificate by the Chinese government. And it's called the Breast Order of the Cloud of Banner. Isn't that a crazy name? But I was, I worked with Chinese for quite a while and they, 
this gave me that. This is the shoulder patch that we wore on the left shoulder. The China Burma India Theater. This is China Burma India. Kind of interesting thing. Uh, I got lots of maps here. The British fought very hard also in, in uh, Burma on the uh, western slope next to India. And this has uh, this is a, a British uh, publication. A friend of mine found these at a, a, a sale, somebody's house or something, you know. And uh, somebody had, had uh, subscribed to this. Good pictures and explanation of when and how things were, were done. And here's a little map of, of, of Burma. And the British were fighting down this corridor here, and this is where we are, where Michinov and then down here. And this goes up into China. Uh, these are little ex CDI magazines, and I've got pictures of different events in, uh, in the German. And believe it or not, they're talking about a World War II memorial in Washington, and there is one for Vietnam, as you know, and I hope if you ever get a chance to see that, that is uh, very, very telling. It was in the page four or five years ago, you saw it. If you're this, is, this is the proposed uh, World War II one in, in uh, Washington, and they've been trying to raise money for several years, and I presume when everything else happens, uh, the federal government will probably appropriate some money and finally get it, uh, enough money to, uh, to have it built. Excuse me, you were saying. I was just going to say, if you're looking at the, the British action, what's the famous movie? Oh, uh, Bridge of the River Kwai? Bridge of the River Kwai. Yes, let me uh, say something about that. Uh, they, uh, In 41, the, uh, uh, of course, they found Pearl Harbor, which is over here, the Jap Japanese did. They came over here and invaded South Vietnam that the French had, and invaded uh, Luzon, Philippines, which were over here. And then they came through here, the Japanese, through Fort, 1941, the rest of 41, and captured all of Southeast Asia. Oh, this map is terrible, of course. You know, there's Indonesia and Siam and all these countries on here. Took over that. And so the Japanese controlled everything. Well, really, China, because that took them out by anything. Burma and all that. India, except for Australia. And they never, never uh, bothered Australia. But uh, in, uh, there was a big sea park. The name isn't. Uh, necessarily interesting to you. Well, I can't think so, but uh, the British had a big seaport here in Singapore, Singapore's the name, and captured uh, 36,000 sailors and soldiers that the British had there. There were some Americans also. And then they were uh, uh, put to building a railroad across here so that the Japanese could uh, uh, transport goods and war materials and everything. And practically all of those those uh, men died. They, and the strange thing to me was, why didn't they take care of them? I mean, they were working for them, and they weren't going to go anyplace. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting psychology of the Japanese. But that was, uh, it really took between the Japanese in Asia, and the Germans in Russia and in, in England and or in uh, Europe, uh, and a lot of the world, a lot of the world, and we were fighting one end of the world or the other. They answer any questions? Yeah, I just do a little addition. I was at a conference at Brockport about five years ago, and. Steve mentioned in Singapore, the British were picked up. There were a number of Americans. 
They also picked up a number of Americans in that area of Indonesia as we were beginning to try to ship people over. And there were two groups, one soldiers, one sailors, from West Texas. Uh, probably about 15 or 2,000 men. That they lived in like towns 20 miles apart. They were rivals in football and the whole bit. It's amazing. Uh, one university down there did a complete study. Because, a complete study because they're you know all in that area and they could. Uh, they interviewed them all. Very much like what we're doing here. Well, they interviewed like two or three hundred men. And what they found out was their survival rate was probably 50% higher than everybody else's. And they said it was all because they were friends. And when, they, when somebody was in desperate shape, there was always somebody to pick them up and carry them, somebody to steal food for them, somebody to do, steal medicine for them. And they worked as a group, and the biggest bulk of them survived. Uh, this uh, this part of uh, my you know, classes got started listening to what they were doing down there, and they went in an audio tape and would present people with an entire book. They said the first books come out were 30 or 40 pages long, and the last ones were 300 pages long, as people got used to talking. So I figured, well, why don't we do the project here, and we get some people in, we can't get the same kind of grouping that they have, but we got people in, we'll try to create a little bit of oral history here. We're trying to, that's what we're doing. I, well, I tried to get uh, Wayland Hamilton and uh, Steve Holly last year for my classes, but uh, they seem to like to prefer the south in the winter time. I called Steve a couple of weeks ago, and I saw him actually during the summer, and said, would you do it? So I'll call you as soon as we get the school settled here at school. And I called, he said, oh, uh, I'm going to Arizona tomorrow. tomorrow. So, you know, I said, well, we got to figure out how we're going to get him in here, and, you know. So, it's a pleasure to have you here, thank, thank you very much. You.